thank you so much for giving me this um, this honor. I was I was telling Prof when I was a kid, I had um, a condition called attention deficit disorder, which meant I could not. Um, if my mother wanted me to sleep, she just made me to sit down on one spot, and after a few minutes, I'll start sleeping. Unfortunately. Nothing has changed much. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about something I'm very, very passionate about also. I'm talking about, you know, collaboration. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a storyteller. Um, I'm sure some of you already know that. I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to tell a story. I like swimming, and when I swim, I got to a stage where I once had lived near the water, so I had this house and there were steps that went right down into the ocean, and it was so nice. So I developed a love for swimming in the, in the ocean. Now, so today when I go to Mombasa, I'll take a boat sometimes and sail out, way out. When I get out there, then the boat stops, he anchors, and I jump out of the boat and I start swimming. It is a most exhilarating experience because there is nobody else there. It is so silent. It's so quiet. And then, you know, the only sound is the water lapping against my body. And then I ask myself, where are the noisemakers? They are at the beach. They can't swim. <laughs> And that was so cool because I realized the language of the beach is different from the language of the deep. In the beach, everybody is there making noise. They're fighting for space, fighting for surfboards, fighting for everything. The language at the beach is the language of competition. But the language in the deep is the language of collaboration. Because if I were to meet anybody else in the deep, there would be a deep swimmer like myself. And at that point, there is no need to compete. Because there is more than enough. So at the beach, there is this feeling that you need to prove yourself and that for you to win, others have to lose. But in the deep, you're already accomplished. And you realize that no one needs to lose for me to win. You realize that the world is a better place with winners. You know, I like to, I, I, I like to study success. And one thing I have found out with success in any form, political, business, success in any form whatsoever is a composite of winners. Let's give an example. A person is declared winner of an election. Presidential, so he's now the president-elect. But you know, he is simply the face or the end result of a chain of, of winners. That chain had the person in charge of strategy. That chain had the people in charge of communications. That chain had the speech writers. That chain had the spin doctors. That chain had all sorts of people. <laughs> that chain had the wife. You know, <laughs> you 
yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> I have to always be politically correct, you know. <laughs> because I have a wife who has a way of hearing what I said when I was outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who her spies in this place might be. <laughs> One day I was on TV and they were asking me, what do you fear? Who do you fear? I said, my wife. <laughs> the fear of the wife is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, if I did not put her in the chain right now, I'll have a query when I get home. Okay. Now, once there is a missing link in the chain, it can bring the whole process down. Imagine a presidential campaign without a communications person. It can bring the whole thing down. I am here because I have a team. I'm the face of a lot of people. I'm the face of again my wife has to appear on every list I'm, I'm the face of my wife who encouraged me when i woke up this morning and said you're gonna have a great day i'm the face of the person who washed my clothes and ironed my clothes i'm the face of the driver who drove so i don't have to drive and I can think about what I'm coming to say. I'm the face of my team here, Jennifer, Tom, who, when I was at the, I was working, I was at the School of Government before coming here, were able to put up all the papers and the sheets, you know, for our strategy session, so I could look good out here. You know, I'm the face of Gertrude, who is out there expecting me to speak well enough for you to go and buy books when I finish speaking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are so many people in that chain. And if one of them is missing, we can have a big problem on our hands. No one in my team feels they need to compete with one another because they are driven by the big picture. No one in the team feels they're doing an inferior job because when they see me out here, they are all happy. When they see me out here, they are all elated that they have done a good job in preparing me, giving me the information, doing the research, giving me ideas, brainstorming with me, acting as sounding boards. You know. So when I come here, everybody is happy that it's working. Now, one question I'd like to put to us, what is the difference between a group and a team? I'll give you an example. If 100 people, we get together, we get on a plane, we're going to Mombasa together. So we're flying the same flight. We get to Mombasa. We are all staying at Sarova White Sands. That still doesn't make us a team. At best, we're a group. What makes us a team is purpose. That's what converts from group to team. Purpose. What is the big picture? Or what is the why of our being together? Without a clear understanding of the why, the what and the how would lead to the dynamics of the beach. Competition if we don't understand the why. We'll be competing against each other. There's a book I read with a title, Made to Stick. The author, authors Chip Heath and Dan Heath 
And there was an account of, it was given by the CEO of Southwest Airlines. Of course, we know the story of Southwest Airlines, a phenomenally successful airline over many years. And it's a budget airline. So they, right now they serve only peanuts. And so this lady from marketing went to meet the CEO and said, we have some research here that if we begin to serve chicken salad on our flights, we will get more people, we will do so much better. And the CEO looked at her and said, will serving chicken salad make us the undisputed low budget airline? Because if it is not, we are not serving that chicken salad. Now that's what it is to be driven by your why. When we are driven by the why, we are no more, and I want to say this because there's a fine line between what I'm about to say, but when you are driven by the why, not every opportunity is your opportunity. Because the why will define the opportunities we take. I had a history of business failure. Lost a lot of money. And went to, I was in Nigeria. Lost a lot of money. I would lived in the US, I went to Nigeria, lost money. Then I came to Kenya. I actually came to Kenya to recover. <laughs> so my Kenyan story is a very, very emotional story and because I had gone to Nigeria with a dream that when I get to Nigeria, I'm going to transform the land. Uh, when I got to Nigeria, the land transformed me. <laughs> and by the time it was done, I had lost $6.3 million. And I tell people, when you fail on that level, you become a successful failure. <laughs> People look at you and they say, oh, we know what you're going through. That's a lie. They got no clue. <laughs> my left hand was twitching like this and my left side of my face was twitching. I was told that's how people behave before they die. And I said, and you know, and I said, you know, my wife is so beautiful. I believe the Lord made her the day after the Sabbath. He had rested well on the Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful girl so I thought if I die then some funny person will marry my wife <laughs> I said that is not acceptable <laughs> so when a friend invited me to Kenya and I realized that I could recover in Kenya and not die I jumped at it so here I am in Kenya loving it absolutely but while I was here, when I first came, I was so poor that poor people called me poor. Now, you need to understand that's not a good place for anybody to be. When people who are certified poor look at you and say, wow, Wale, you're poor. You know, you're so poor you can't pay attention. That is where I was. And in that state, I had an offer from a company in America to come and be chief operations officer. And they were offering me gobs of money. Now, I want you to understand how poor I was. Maybe if I paint the picture, you will get it. You know, I had flown first class all my life. Here I was, I couldn't afford a plane ticket from Mombasa, I was staying in Kilifi with this friend. I couldn't afford a plane to get from Kilifi to Nairobi. So if I needed to come here, the cheapest bus was called Busways. There was another one called Taufik. <laughs> now, <laughs> there's nothing like business class economy. Everybody was in the same struggling class. <laughs> and when you sat in that bus, if it went around a bend, you thought you were going to drop out. <laughs> this Busways bus. And there was this day I'm sitting 
and there's a lady sitting next to me. I used to travel at night because I didn't want people to see me. So I felt it was better to travel at night. So there was this lady who was sitting next to me and she had two little babies that she's trying to manage. Now, without asking for permission, she just gives me one of them, thick. <laughs> So I spent the whole night rocking a baby. I don't know if it's male or female. I don't know nothing about that baby. So that is, and then, oh my goodness, then you get to void. This was an interesting one. At 2 a.m., I'm sleeping, and then somebody hits me at 2 a.m. So I woke up, I said, what? With a smile on his face, Jugu Korosho, Jugu Korosho. <laughs> At 2 a.m. Who does that? <laughs> who? who does that? So while I am in this state, I am getting invitations to come and work in the United States, to come and work in the UK, in the United Kingdom. And everybody wondered, are you crazy? Why didn't you go? I didn't go for the same reason why I did not take, I did not um, take the path they were asking me to take in Nigeria. You see, I had done a lot of work for some state governments and they had, you know, refused to pay me. The governor that I thought was my friend was no more available to talk to me. And so I went to meet a very wealthy man who knew all these people. And I said, can you please just help me call the governor? He said, no problem. He said, I will do that. Then he picked out his phone and then he dials. Then he stops. He said, Awale, what was the arrangement you had with the governor? I said, there was no arrangement, sir. He laughed. He put down the phone and he began to laugh hysterically. He said, you are no more in America. You are in Nigeria. Did you for one minute think that somebody is going to pay you that amount of money without an arrangement? <laughs> so I thought he was just being funny. I talked to about two or three other people. And the answer was the same. So I decided that um, I probably need some divine intervention. So I went to meet one of our Nigerian bishops <laughs> to help me. He was worse than all the others put together. <laughs> so that's how I found myself here. But the point I'm making, if you do not have your big why defined, you will follow all sorts of, you will fall into what I call the opportunity trap. Now, my big why was simple. You know, and that's why, you know, people ask me, how could you walk out? I said, if you have not said yes to something, you will not be able to say no. What gives me the power? What gave me the power to say yes or to say no to corruption? was because I had said yes to so many other things. I had said yes to being a great father, being a great husband. I had said yes to being a mentor and leader and a, and a coach for many for leaders in Africa. Because my yes was strong enough, my no was easy enough. So, what have you said yes to? I've said yes to a purpose that's bigger than the opportunities or than anything I can see. And that way I'm not driven solely by the strength of an opportunity. I'm driven by the strength of my purpose. I hope I am communicating. Now, let's look at football. Because it's a very easy analogy. 11 people are driven by a singular goal. A purpose we must make sure against all odds against all opposition we put the ball behind that net the purpose is so well defined 
That's what makes a team. We are united around a purpose. Now, do you know, if I'm going with the ball, and I look at you, and I see you are a better place to score, I will pass to you, isn't it? Now, guess what? I don't need to like you. <laughs> <laughs> All I need to know is that if I pass it to you, you will score. And when you score, I have scored. It's not about liking you. Do you know we can have a very successful team and we don't like each other? But we better love each other. You know, love is a command, like is a choice. <laughs> <clears throat> Am I communicating? So think of yourselves like a football team. That we must never lose sight of the goal. And one beautiful thing about football is that individuals score, but teams are remembered. You know, the individual can score today. And people will celebrate the individual that scored for a few days. But you ask a year from today who won that match, they will tell you the team, not the individual. Because individuals are forgotten, teams are remembered. A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of working with the United Nations on a project called Delivering As One. And um, we were privileged to be able to drive that in all the agencies in Kenya. And um, because before delivering as one, you had all these agencies acting alone, making the United Nations look like the beach. So you had, it was a battleground of competition amongst agencies especially that had similar things going on. And it was a big irony because the same organization that was supposed to help seamless support of government and the people of Kenya suddenly looked disorganized at a stage to a point where, um, you know, and that was such a big irony. And it also created a platform where people could take advantage of the system. So you go to, say, Machakos or wherever, and you will have organizations that have pitched the same project to different agencies. All right? But because the agencies were not talking to each other, nobody knew what was going on. Now, so in order to become coherent, the 20, 2006 report proposing the one UN states that, and I quote, in order to become coherent, effective, and efficient in the area of development, the UN system needs to deliver at one, deliver as one at the country level. So I had the privilege of visiting a number of nations that were delivering as one nations, and I saw the benefits of this concept in real time. And if delivering as one was good for the United Nations, I believe it's good for Strathmore also. Even the Bible gives numerous examples of the benefits of collaboration. You know, Moses was the one that was to deliver the children of Israel. And Moses said, God, I can't go because I have a speech impediment. One would have thought that the almighty God would say, okay, Moses, no problem. I'm going to fix your impediment. <laughs> that seems like a logical thing to do. But instead, what did God do? God said, no problem, Moses. Aaron, he's a good talker. So you deal with your impediment, but Aaron will come with you. And so whatever I tell you, let Aaron tell them. <laughs> no. That's a good place for Moses to get offended. 
they say, you know what? If Aaron is the one that talks, he's the one that will be on camera. <laughs> Aaron is the one that's going to look like a star. But you know what? They kept their eye on the big why. Let's deliver the important thing is the message is delivered. Even Jesus had a team. They had to collaborate. Of course, within the team, there are dynamics because then you find out they are fighting. Okay, who is going to sit on your right hand, by the way, before we get serious into this business? You know, who's going to be on your right hand? And then they bring their mother. <laughs> and their mother begins to say, you know, your children, my children, let one sit on your right, let one sit on your left, you know. Who does that? You will always have the dynamics in the team. But Jesus said, you know what? It's not for me to decide that. <laughs> so Jesus just um, passed it on to God. And you know, they couldn't see God, so. <laughs> then there's another very interesting example in, in the Bible, in, you know, in Acts of the Apostles. You know, they had an administrative problem. He said, the widows were being missed out. You know, the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples and said, it's not good we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Look amongst yourselves seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. Now, you know what? We are a team. Some of us, our role in the team is to give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. Some people will give themselves to the administration. And the same place, the whole multitude, when we deliver as one, driven by the big why, the people we serve will be the beneficiaries. We have seen, of course, we've seen that um, in Kenya, just one, just one handshake of collaboration can change everything. <laughs> you didn't need two handshakes, just one. And then, of course, you now have a lot of copycat handshakes, you know, wanna be at other levels. <laughs> but isn't it interesting? Just one handshake of collaboration changes the whole picture. And the people that they are called to serve are the beneficiaries. The human body is perhaps the best argument for collaboration, for the importance of collaboration. Each part of the body has its own function. Now, if the legs, I, I, I've seen some fantastic artists that paint with their legs. But you know what happens? their hands are not there so if the legs have to do what the hand ought to do or the hands have to do what the legs have to do then there is a disability somewhere able-bodied institutions are institutions where each unit has a different role understands their role, is secure in their role, and knows that I am going to focus in this area when I win, the whole team wins. That is an able-bodied institution. Finally, I was on the Strathmore website as I was preparing for this. And I saw the most exciting thing ever, the Strathmore coat of arms. And what does the coat of arms, what is the message of the coat of arms? There's the lion, which is the symbol of strength and courage and of the determined fight for excellence and justice. 
It also represents Kenya, a country which strives to attain all the qualities mentioned above. That's a direct quote from the website. But have you thought of it? So the lion is there, but lions operate in prides. So they collaborate. If you are not convinced with the lion, then let's look at the three hearts on the coat of arms. The three hearts represent the three races, which in 1961, when the university started, were segregated in the colonial system of education. The heart represents the person, since it is taken as the source of all our actions and the source of love. The fact that the three hearts have all the same color shows the equality of all people and their aim to love and understand each other. At the beginning, it clearly pointed at the target of racial unity. Today, it symbolizes the, co the common aim of parents, teachers, and students in the educational process of Strathmore. Again, that's a direct lift from the website. So again, that is sending the message that the big why, the big purpose of this institution can never be accomplished without internal and external collaboration. Then, we look at the rose. The rose in full bloom represents love. The source of all good desires and actions, even if at times this means loving sacrifice as represented by the thorns. So, we will sacrifice our personal egos, ambitions, for the greater good and purpose for which the university exists. And only then can we bloom as the rose. The process of sacrifice can be painful, hence the thorns. But that's the only way to sacrifice, to, to fulfill the big why. And then finally, there is the motto that all may be one. It expresses our desire to work together towards the same aim in spite of personal differences or opinions, tastes, and background. This is another direct lift from the website. So what's my conclusion? The Bible says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth must be established. The lion, the three hearts, the rose, and the motto. Those are four witnesses. <laughs> four witnesses as to why collaboration is not a suggestion. It's not a good idea. It is the very essence of our existence and the energy that will take this great institution to the next level. Thank you.